Do good work is not a label, but a way of living. It is the constant and diligent effort to achieve a new level of excellence in one's own life. It is the hidden inner beauty behind the struggle to achieve excellence. It's not perfect, but imperfect. It is the effort, discipline, and focus that often goes unnoticed. The goal of do good work is to highlight that drive. The guests I have on this show emulate this drive in their own special way. You'll be able to apply new ideas into your own life by learning from them. We will also have one-on-one episodes with me where we'll dive into my own experience with entrepreneurship and leadership. Every episode is designed to provide you with ideas that you can apply and grow in excellence in all areas of your life, business, and career. Today on the show, we have Suraj Venkat. He is a serial entrepreneur and the CEO of Atten Ventures, which is a venture builder and ecosystem for startups and founders in the B2B SaaS and artificial intelligence space. Suraj is currently leading three ventures that are just about to drop at the time of this recording. Bitsbaza.io, a marketplace for enterprise and deep tech. Also, Auto Contento, which is a content creation tool that's the Chrome extension, and he's also creating a product suite for venture, venture capitalists. Atten Ventures was founded on the belief that remote entrepreneurship can unlock massive value creation, and they're on the mission to enable the growth of 100 next generation products with their help. Well, Suraj, thank you for being on today, man. Thank you, Raul, for having me. So that's one of the things that, you know, is really interesting in your perspective. And when it comes to building systems, when you have a team and organization, or when you have a product or a service, we always look at building a system or a people around the system that we have, not building a system around our people. Can you tell me more about your methodology or your ideology around why that approach? So I think uh, most companies are trying to save two things. At the core, they're trying to either save money or they're trying to save time. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at any department inside a company, now let's look at sales or marketing, for instance. Mm -hmm. The easiest way for them to begin that operation or to sustain that operation is to just buy tools that are available in the market, right? Mm -hmm. But those tools that you buy from the market may not be absolutely you know like in line with who mans those operations inside your company mm, like a p- tool tool to people fit right there's not a in, there's incompatibility it, it, or we're trying to force people to use something. correct there is never going to be a hundred percent match unless you custom build those tools yourself mm-hmm. that's why i think it's good to adopt but i also think you have to really understand your own people your own processes first and then build some custom tools around your people and, and your processes rather than doing the other way, which is, you know, buying tools and then making your people work around those tools. I think one thing that happens, especially with the plethora of tools available, especially in sales and marketing, mm-hmm. because everyone is making this new thing that will make you skyrocket your oh, lead yeah. gen. And it's never actually going to do that. But people believe that, you know, that fantasy and then they go ahead and buy all these tools and, and then they waste a lot of time. Uh, and they, they complexify a very simple operation. It's interesting. So you, it's, it's going back to framework driven, understanding the actual strategy and then understanding your people. And then before you actually go out and either build a system or actually buy the tools, it's more like, well, we've got to build around our actual strategy, our actual niche, our actual offers, and then go to market with that. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a better way to do it, but that's just my perspective. Uh, I think in the long run, it will save you time, but in the short run, it's going to cost you time. What are some examples that you've seen either with your own ventures or with client ventures in regards to how how to identify that misconception and how to take a pause in order to look at frameworks as opposed to looking at solutions first? Absolutely. So let's look at a very simple example of email marketing. Now, there are a million tools uh, out there for email marketing and each one each one of them is telling you, okay, you can fire like 5,000 emails a day. Mm -hmm. And if you go on Google and you type in, you know, what are the expected conversion rates out of cold, like emailing 5,000 people, it's going to give you a number, right? Now, when you actually run that number for a company that's very niche, 
uh, let's say an AI company, for instance, you're not going to get the same conversion rate as a company that's selling, let's say, marketing services. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be the same. So even the benchmarks that you find online, they are not going to uh, be a hundred percent match with what you'll experience in your own organization. Mm -hmm. So the benchmarks are very arbitrary. Uh, and because those benchmarks are arbitrary, uh, you are going ahead and buying a specific tool that you may not need. You may not need to actually email 5,000 people a month. In mm -hmm. fact, that may, that may actually hurt you. Um, so this is what I experienced. Like we ran automated emails Mm -hmm. we found the conversions to be uh, very low and pretty bad, like did not bring any revenue. So then what we did is we went for very high relevance. We only mm -hmm. went for people who were, you know, a specific job title, uh, saying a specific thing on LinkedIn and we were personalizing each of those interactions over email, like each and every one, like two or three lines in the opening email would be personalized. And then, you know, we, we didn't do it for a very high volume, but even like, when, once we sent it to 400 people, we saw that 12 people responded, which is like 3% conversions. Mm -hmm. And when I was uh, running these tools and when we were mass emailing people with, you know, that whole cadence, mm -hmm. it was not working at all. Uh, so obviously we were separating ourselves by thinking out of the box and, you know, like thinking more about our customers and what they'd be more interested in. Okay, a very personalized approach, understanding them. And we also built the, tools that we were using to personalize, uh, you know, in, in, in such a way that we, we, we uh, even if you weren't able to hit, let's say, you know, 3,000 or 4,000 emails a month, even if you were able to hit a quarter, mm -hmm. uh, we were able to fast track that particular process inside our organization. And that gave us like better returns than automation. Yeah, and the personalization, but also looking at the customer experience. I mean, for this instant itself, let's talk about a little bit more about how you do that um, build with a person first and then build systems around their technology. Let's talk about your in the AI space, right? Let's talk about, you know, the different levels of artificial intelligence as well as how you're taking that same methodology, that framework of start with the people first and then build around the people and the needs and the necessities. How are you doing that over on the artificial intelligence space? Absolutely. I think that's a great question because a lot of times when people look at an engineering product, they are very focused on the engineering aspect. Oh, hey, mm -hmm. this is built with, you know, like blazingly fast. Uh, I, I don't know, like uh, like the, the network me mechanism or the uh, the back end is uh, very scalable or, or uh, you know, it, it's processing at, you know, like a thousand tra like transactions per second or something. But they're not looking at the user, the end user. Let's look at an AI product uh, that we have, which is a visual quality inspection AI mm -hmm. product. Uh, it can be used uh, in the uh, fisheries uh, domain. So uh, you can look at a batch of fish and you can say how fresh it is and uh, how much you should pay for this batch of fish. Mm. Uh, this becomes especially important when you're bulk buying fish uh, yeah. at the seaports. Yeah. Uh, and there is no, uh, it's, it's a very manual process at the moment because uh, there's experienced buyers who go in and then who give you a price. Uh, there's no standardization. So how do you bring standardization? Uh, obviously, uh, the AI alone is not going to bring in standardization. It has to be accepted by the people. Mm -hmm. So if I give them a phone app that they can point onto the fish, and if the like like the UI or you know the user interface or the product itself has to be so simple that it can be understood by a buyer at the fish port. So that buyer may not be the most uh, you know like tech savvy person, may not have the best gadgets. Uh, uh, in some of our pilots that we've been running in India, uh, they have Android phones, which mm -hmm. uh, some of them do have good uh, camera capabilities. Some of them do not have the best camera capabilities. So we've had to build solutions that can be ported onto, you know, like not so advanced Android phones and which the user interface has to be simple visual enough for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a person who is not the most tech savvy to use, you know, to give us feedback and, uh, you know, for, for uh, the whole buying to uh, proceed very flawlessly. Uh, so I think it's very important to understand who the buyer is, what the buyers or the user's habits are, 
and really keep things simple for the buyer actually whether it's a you know like a high level ceo or you know the tech lead at a company or uh, you know somebody buying fish uh, you know who, who may not come from the most technical background i think at the end of the day uh, a good system is captured by its simplicity and i i really like this saw uh, uh the saying by uh, leonardo da vinci actually uh, who said uh, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication mm. uh and i i really vibe with that and i think uh, that's something that um should dictate how you build your product around people keep things simple for the end user and i think so breaking that down in regards to what you just mentioned so you find a problem in the marketplace and you do kind of do a lot of the design thinking work itself what's the user's limitations what are the capabilities what can they do and what are the potentials of what they can do on top of that or what they can't do with that and then from there building either technology that fits that need but also you mentioned something which is kind of a harder bridge to gap when it comes to adaptation and standardization right like if i give someone the power to understand and get more value and more information how can i ensure that there is communication across different cultures or different groups or different buyers or sellers so they all understand the baseline of what value uh the value is of what we're talking about and they can they can also perceive value at a different range of scale that way when you go to i guess um standardize something everyone understands what you're talking about as opposed to having different value systems on the same um of item of of uh, value or of uh, of interest yeah that's pretty interesting and i think uh, one way to address that whole standardization uh challenge is uh, to actually build very feedback driven systems mm. so you should uh, have a good understanding of all the different user personas that are using your product mm mm-hmm. and uh you should be collecting feedback in some ways so oh, hey why did you pay exactly. $5 for yeah why did you pay $5 for this fish while i showed you it's like what $7 then mm-hmm. he types in something oh the color was a little off then uh you know the ai can look at the data and say okay probably his camera feed was not very good i picked up a different color but he tells me something else so the next time we see somebody else using a similar device let's say it was a, a samsung uh, i don't know any of the models but let's say you know like uh, xyz1 model and Too we many, find yeah. some yeah some other person in a similar lighting condition using that then we know that it's going to be off by a percentage you know there's going to be a little bit of error in uh, what the computer computes so you can show that variance on the screen and tell them that it might be between this and this and over time as the machine learns i think over you know usually what we've noticed with our applications is uh, uh up front we don't promise like 99% accuracy we tell them things like hey, you begin it's probably going to be like 80% but after 6 months we're going to get closer and closer to 96 99% uh and and that's what we've done in the past and i think startups in general are moving towards that too they don't have anything perfect out of the box out of the gate when they go to market and i think that's key to have different feedback loops and different feedback systems in order to adjust and readjust course as you get closer and closer and better to truth you know in the book i talked about the uh, fibonacci sequence of events right the first time you go out to mm-hmm. do something might take you 21 attempts to get it right and you're getting closer than the second time you go to do something it might take you 15 times to get it right and then the third time eight times etc cetera, etc cetera, getting closer to more attempts less tries to get closer to what actually works in the marketplace so going back to artificial intelligence you mentioned in when our pre conversation that um right now there's three different levels of artificial intelligence but we are currently at stage 2 out of the three can you explain the three levels and what does it mean to be in stage 2 Okay the way i think about it is very simple um you know when people say ai they could mean any of the three levels like you mentioned it could be level 1 where it's simple automation so you know just making your life a little bit easier with some simple automations mm-hmm. uh second level is uh, decision support where the ai is helping you uh make decisions for instance the fish example that i was telling you about the guy pointing his camera and the ai assisting the guy in you know shopping for fish mm-hmm. that would be uh the bulk of the applications we see today for instance lead scoring they they speak about ai doing lead scoring how good these leads are for you and your company uh again it's yeah it, again it's so uh, it's an example of uh 
uh, decision support. Most things you see today, it's, it's all decision support. Uh, decision making would be the third level and that's what we get closer to when we speak about uh, uh, autonomous cars, autonomous vehicles. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not saying there are no applications right now that are at level three, but most applications that we interact with today are at level two. Um, and again, uh, one thing I'd like to point out, you know, the way people look at uh, software uh, is very different uh, when you're looking at, uh, you know, what I'd like to call like traditional, you know, software. And when you look at AI software, mm-hmm. when you look at traditional software, it's programmed to do a certain task and it does that mm-hmm. most of the time. Input, uh, output, right? Yeah, input, output. Here it's input and then it's giving you a probability. Oh, hey, it's going to be 70%, you know, A or it might be 30% B. So Based on the uh, data that you feed it. Exactly. That, that's what AI is. And, you know, and, and again, when you look at an autonomous vehicle, the fact is it could be right 99% of the time, but hey, if it's wrong 1% of the time, there's going to be a lot of backlash because there's also a lot of uh, ethical components to AI the risk application. Factor. Yeah, the risk exactly. Factor. So I think it's important to know within your organization or within teams, like what levels uh, that you're leveraging, you know, artificial intelligence or just technology at that point. Because in any single company, there's three things that you can leverage. You can leverage people, uh, not that they're workhorses, but like they can actually do better work than you can in, in some areas in the business. You can also leverage systems, meaning there's a system where things get done and that you don't have to do that. Or you can leverage technology. In this specific case, you can leverage artificial intelligence. And I think it's key to understand what kind of technology you're leveraging. Is it just a simple automation where input one task, zap there creates like a checklist for you when you have a new client, for example. But also with decision support, I think that is significantly untapped in other areas outside of marketing. I know that there's lead scoring. I know there's, there's different probabilities, but I haven't seen a lot of, and maybe this is just my ignorance, but I haven't seen a lot of like decision support systems when it comes to managing human beings, managing or predicting um, for, for leadership teams or being able to be uh, predicting capacity or for, for labor intensive businesses. So I think getting more exposure there in the last stage, I think it's like you mentioned, it exists, but it's not as prevalent where technology is making decisions for us. And when you understand that as a team, I think it's important for everyone to, to see what kind of technology they are leveraging and how they might be able to leverage um, a more sophisticated technology to make better decisions or to move the company faster, like you mentioned, make more profits or reduce costs and create a greater impact at the same time. And I think those are like the trifecta that we're looking at. When we talk about um, what you're doing uh, with your ventures, as well as talking about capital, you mentioned also that there is capital you know, efficiency. And when you're efficient with your capital, why that can be undervalued by either investors or for outside parties. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that? Yeah, this is a topic I have many thoughts around. Uh, you know, I've definitely, uh, you know, gone through phases where, you know, my company has done well and then, you know, it's contracted and then back. Um, and then now, you know, we're reaching a point of stability and then we want to go venture scale with some of our ventures. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think something that I've learned is capital is not a constraint as much as people mm-hmm. would like you to believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, if anything, I'll tell you that uh, looking at capital as a constraint is going to push you back as a company. Uh, you're not going to be as creative. You're not going to create value if you're going to look at capital as a constraint. Uh, Let's look at that, that thinking though. How So that we can identify how would you hear a founder think about capital as a constraint? What are the thoughts that are going through? What are the, how are they making that decision? I'll give you a little story that will tell you that capital or, you know, like uh, here, it's, it's, it, it might shift your thinking, um, you know, and make you think a little like a contrarian. So mm-hmm. um, uh, it's actually a personal anecdote. So when I was like, you know, in fourth grade, I was tasked with uh, selling lemonade mm-hmm. at, at the lemonade stand. Uh, just like, you know, most kids do. Uh, But here it was more like, uh, you know, who could demonstrate, you know, the best collections. Uh, I don't even know why we were measuring this as, uh, you know, friends, but it Mm -hmm. it was an interesting thing to try out. Uh, So I obviously set up a lemonade stand 
but I didn't sell the lemonades for, to get the collections. Hmm. I actually sold the experience of, uh, uh, I, I actually had a golf club, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, you know, I brought it from my home and then I, I set up a small, you know, like track. Mm-hmm. And then I, 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 I basically built people for the mini golf experience and I just gave them lemonades free. <laughs> so uh, it, it, it's always not what you think that matters to generate revenue. It's, it's always uh, things that you're not thinking about that will generate the revenue for you. For instance, you know, many people are fixated on, hey, I'm going to charge people, um, you know, once they sign up for my product, you know, and I'm going to charge them like $10 to do this, this, and this because it solves Mm -hmm. these problems. I'm going to say maybe that's not how you monetize it. Maybe give the tool to them for free and then charge them for the support on the tool. That's what Microsoft did with a lot of their, uh, you know, uh, software. They made it open source, but they charged Mm -hmm. people for the support that they offered. So you can be very creative like that. Again, mm-hmm. uh, obviously Microsoft was venture scale and you know, they're big, but I think even as a startup founder who's bootstrapped, you can figure out many creative ways to structure your, you know, like operations and processes so that they don't uh, consume a lot of, you know, costs every month for you mm-hmm. and also provide a lot of value to your end customer and, you know, uh, get enough money coming in and then use that money to, you know, do, uh, some things that will allow you to, uh, you know, uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, like expand your service and product offerings and, you know, make things better. But again, it's, it's a slow route. You know, when you go, uh, you know, the whole bootstrap route, you'll be constrained by the lack of capital and you'll always have to be thinking outside the box. Mm-hmm. So I think after a certain point, it doesn't make sense, but I would strongly recommend anyone doing it for the first three years minimum. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, if you have a few ideas or if you have a few products, then going for venture scale with one of them, because at the end of three years, you'll have very solid mechanics for a company, especially mm-hmm. if it's your first three years in business. You have no clue, man, how things are, you know, in business. It's yeah. your first time. Uh, so I, I think cute. strong mechanics with bootstrapping and then, you know, go venture scale once you have strong mechanics. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Love bootstrapping and that idea. But, and I, and I like how this goes to a similar, I guess, phraseology that I've heard is that you don't, you're not selling what you think you're selling, right? And so looking at your products or services in a different perspective saying, why are people actually buying what we do? And then when you understand what that is, um, you can either price based on value or you can position yourself based on the actual reason why people are actually buying your products or services. And I, and I like how you were able to give us that idea, man, at fourth grade, <laughs> what a good idea to sell an experience. That was my first, uh, I would say like experience as an entrepreneur. Uh, then I had a couple of failed, uh, uh, you know, a lot of failed experiments, but that was, uh, you know, my first one and that got me hooked, man. That's what I do. That's why I do what I do. It's always about thinking outside the box. That's awesome. Well, what's next for At Ventures? What are you guys doing? What's the, what's the next trajectory that you're doing? So we're working with very interesting companies and very interesting that you brought up the workspace and, uh, you know, measuring the capacity utilization of your workforce. We're actually working with a, a company in Singapore, uh, uh, iTech Genic, and uh, mm-hmm. they basically uh, have an AI-powered uh, workforce management tool that uh, mm-hmm. they've also onboarded Oracle, actually, as a customer. That's awesome. That's exciting. That's a, definitely a huge need I've seen either with my clients or just in the marketplace in general, especially for labor intensive companies. Absolutely. But yeah, that's one of the many things. And, uh, you know, we have a Chrome extension that we're rolling out for content creation. Mm-hmm. We're trying to go heads on with, uh, you know, like uh, Canva, but I, I don't know if you'll reach the scale Canva will, but at least we'll delight a thousand or 10,000 customers. And that, that's enough for us, to be honest. We don't want to, you know, have like so many users and, you know, like not give them the care and attention, but we're looking at a specific niche, a specific persona, and we want them to be very happy. Uh, Besides that, obviously the marketplace uh, for deep tech, that's our biggest bet. Uh, Mm -hmm. That's where all my energy is on. Uh, And then we have a couple of other, uh, you know, interesting startups that are at idea slash pre-seed stage Mm -hmm. that we're working on. That's exciting. Well, for all of our listeners who can want to reach out to you, thank you for this episode. It's also learn more about you. What's the best place for them to go? 
Uh, LinkedIn would be the best place. I'm hyperactive on LinkedIn, as you've observed, Raul. I reply to each and every message that I receive. So definitely feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn and uh, to follow the content too. I put out only like free content anyway. So Absolutely. So we'll put that link in the show notes as well. But uh, Suraj, thank you so much for being on, man. Hey, thank you so much, Raul, for having me and your journey so far with, uh, you know, all these podcasts that you've been doing. And um, um, I, I'm, I'm so excited to be listening to everything from here on. Absolutely, man. I appreciate the support and we're, not, we're all in all of this together. Let's do good work. Absolutely. Thank you, Raul. Have a great day.